nodes. Trusted nodes are uh, the assumption that I can send a signal from node one to node two. Node two can repeat the signal and send it to node three, but therefore you have to trust that node two will not reveal your secret. Well, another way around trusted nodes is to have something like an access network. Here you are distributing entanglement, not just uh, prepare and send like the trusted node case. So you can send entanglement between two users and then choose have optical switches to choose which two users are active at any one given time. These access networks are nice because they have a single source. You can have many users, but because of the active switching, they're slow, they have limited connectivity, and they cannot be anonymous because you have to send a request saying, can user A be connected to user B so everyone knows who's talking to whom. What we want to do is create a quantum communication network which has the simplest possible physical layer which is a single source serving all users with just one fiber per user, but have an arbitrarily complex quantum correlation layer. So we can distribute bipartite entangled states between any pair of users and all do everything simultaneously, which then enables everyone to execute the standard quantum communication protocols such that every user can talk to every other user securely and simultaneously. This is an example of how a physical system would look um, and an eight user network being implemented across the city of Bristol. It essentially relies on a wavelength division multiplexing of an entangled photon pair source, which we start over here. And this has a broad bandwidth that we split into several ITU channels. Due to conservation of energy in the down conversion process that creates these photon pairs inside the source, we have entanglement between fixed ITU channels only. So depending on the way we redistribute these channels to different users, we can create a fully connected mesh or a fully connected network between all these users. We've been able to demonstrate this with uh, long distance links in a loopback configuration across various locations in the city of Bristol, including um, across a few kilometers from the university buildings all the way to the city center. So the whole way we do this is just assigning these wavelengths in pairs to multiple users. And if we change the way we assign these wavelengths, we can change the topology of the network arbitrarily. So our eight user quantum network is fully connected. So every user can talk to everybody else. We can also have extra on-demand channels that can be connected to certain users to boost the key rate generated when necessary. We were able to show that this network can operate for uh, very long periods of time. So this is the entire uh, 18 hour hold time of our detectors with uh, rather stable uh, key rates. And we can even assume uh, and take care of finite key effects and long distance links as well. This is uh, just to show you that we are generating all the 32 keys across the network simultaneously, uh, whereas where the longest distance links have the least key rate and uh, the regular links have a much higher key rate. And it's reasonably stable across the entire time period. But now we have a quantum network. What can we do with such a quantum network? And what can we do to exploit the uh, easy scalability and fully connected nature of our quantum network? Well, my point of view is that if we are building the next generation of networks, we want to make that network useful for far more than just one task. So I'm going to go through uh, and introduce you to the concept of these four protocols, which we were able to implement on the network. So let's first go to anonymous messaging. Anonymous messaging is something that could be solved long ago. Uh, and essentially, it's the cryptographer's dining problem. If everybody shares private randomness, then all you have to do is compute the parity and uh, the one transmitter 
just flips the parity and sends it. Then if the parity of the, all the transmitted bits is one, there is a transmission. If zero, there's nothing. And you can repeat this to send a long binary message. This is an old solution, but cannot be implemented because of the difficulty of sharing private randomness. However, at least until now. The, fortunately, what we have is a, a fully connected quantum network that shares uh, perfectly random quantum keys, which are guaranteed to be random as well. And therefore we have this private randomness. So in an adaptation to our protocol along with the University of Sheffield, we were able to implement five different anonymous protocols including uh, anonymous broadcasting, veto, uh, notification, and even message transmission. We were also able to implement collision detection schemes where if multiple users need to try and transmit at the same time, the protocol can handle it. The next protocol I'll quickly touch upon is digital signatures. The idea is that if Alice digitally signs a document, sends it to Bob. Bob must be able to verify that it came from Alice. It must be transferable. So the document sent to Bob can be forwarded to Casper. Casper should also verify that it was indeed from Alice. And it should also be unforgeable. Uh, using protocols developed by uh, collaborators in Harriet Watt, we were able to actually demonstrate such things on our quantum network as well. Basically, during the preparation step, we would distribute quantum keys, uh, generate hash keys from the quantum keys, and distribute these signature keys to every user, such that uh, once a message is sent, they can compute the hash and the signature keys to make sure that everything is secure and safe, and either accept or reject the protocol. The nice thing about this digital signature protocol that we were able to implement is we can support a very high failure probability and up to half the parties in the network being dishonest. We also can have several different fault tolerant verification levels and be more efficient in terms of our quantum resource usage than other particles, uh, than other pro uh, um, protocols. Another protocol we have been implementing is authentication. And this is a central issue to uh, quantum key distribution and quantum communication at large. The problem is if Alice is sending a message, Alice needs to be able to verify the identity of who's the real Ivan. To do this, you have to have a pre-shared key that you exchange before the first time you communicate. Now, this leads us to the almost absurd requirement that every user on the network should already know every other user on the network. And as the network size grows, this is definitely infeasible. So what can we do? Well, taking inspiration from peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols, we can use a, a friend, so a mutual friend. Say, Casper says, I know the real Ivan, I will put you in touch. But if Alice as accepts Casper's offer and uses Casper as a trusted node, is there a way to prevent Casper from always being a security risk? Because if you trust Casper once and Casper uh, ends up being dishonest, then there's nothing that can save you. Well, the answer is no. We have an authentication transfer protocol such that Alice needs to trust Casper only for a short amount of time. Uh, and we have implemented this in our eight user network with uh, trust times between about 10 to 30 minutes. This means that if you're adding a new user into a quantum network, you do not need to notify every other user on the network. You just need to notify one nearest neighbor and ensure temporary physical security of that nearest neighbor while this user gets authenticated into the network. And this allows us to actually start building and deploying quantum networks on a much larger scale. The last protocol I'll come to is flooding. And flooding is a nice way to optimally make use of uh, idle resources in a quantum network.
So uh, this is in, with collaborators in the University of New York. We have come up with a protocol where you can divide any quantum network into a directional graph and compute the optimal usage of any idle key production inside the network such that we can concatenate keys together to create an increased key rate between uh, any two users in the network. So in this example, users C and D have an increased key by using intermediary users as temporary trusted nodes. And the thickness of the line represents the uh, fraction of the key that's being used. We can show that we have a significant increase in key rate. For example, the, in each of these bars, the darker uh, line is the amount of key that we were able to generate between uh, Alice, Bob, Roy, Dave, so on, with, uh, without flooding protocols. And the lighter line at the top is that with flooding protocols. Not only can we do a uh, flooding protocol to improve key rate, we can also combine these flooding protocols uh, to use uh, better security. Suppose you have different users in the network and each person has a small probability or a perceived probability according to uh, a user's preference of being trustworthy or not. Then by using multiple non-overlapping paths, MNOPs, and uh, these perceived trust values in, the in a table like this, we can compute a route between say Alice and Ivan using other users in the network in order to uh, improve not only the total key rate, but the perceived security as well, such that if any one user or any one non-overlapping path is uh, faulty, the entire key stays safe because keys from multiple non-overlapping paths are exored, not concatenated. With this, I would like to conclude by saying what we have is a conceptually simple architecture, which has highly different physical and quantum layers, which makes the whole thing very versatile and expandable with minimal resources. We do not need to use trusted nodes. And we are aiming at this as a solution for um, local area or city, city area networks. It has the same physical complexity for any complexity of the entanglement distribution stage. We have been able to implement a whole set of protocols um, and we are working on others. I would also like to advertise that we are in close collaboration with the Smart Internet Labs High Performance Networking Group and working on uh, machine learning network control, resource optimization, uh, coexistence with classical and quantum signals along the same fiber within the same network and, and more. Lastly, uh, all this work and all these protocols were supported by a lot of collaborators. So I have uh, more than 40 people to thank and I'd like to thank them all. Um, and it's been supported to a large extent by the Quantum Communications Hub funded by EPSRC. With that, um, a shameless advertisement that if you find this interesting, please do get in touch. There are positions available and we are looking for PhD students and postdocs. Thank you. Thanks very much, Siddharth. We, we've got one question for you from, from the chat, which is, can the same fiber be used for both quantum and classical communications? Okay. Um, this is something I was touching upon, and this is ongoing work. Uh, but to some extent, it can be, but the default answer is no, because if you use a bright classical signal, there is a really a, almost no way to separate that from, or the effects of that from quantum signals. The solution to that would be tune your uh, classical signal into particular wavelength bands and particular uh, transmit powers such that this works. Um, I won't give away that secret too much because I'm sure you'll be hearing about hearing about these results very soon. Okay, thanks very much for that. I think we better um, close the session there. I want to th thank all the speakers uh, for those really interesting talks.